Frida is back. We're going to talk about this new, uh, your novel called The Mark in English. And uh, it's your, actually your debut novel. Uh, you've written some poetry and short stories before, but this one is your first. And uh, could I, congratulations for coming out in many countries with this book. Um, in this novel, we are in uh, Iceland in, in the future. I think it's a quite near future, but uh, it's not specified in the book. Um, and, and, and something happened in the future. They uh, invented an empathy test that can show how, we're, how well you're doing on a, on a scale of empathy. Um, what had originally inspired you to write this book? Um, <clears throat> there were a few uh, factors that came together. Um, you know, at the time I was um, having very fierce arguments with my parents, who was on the opposite side of the political spectrum. And um, I had this... Um, Suddenly, I had this very strange and and strong feeling that you know, if we were in the natural system, we would be in the same herd. But now we were in two different uh, herds, having two different information and putting two different uh, meanings into the same words, and so our arguments led nowhere all of the time. And um, I realized that I that I really wanted to to discuss polarization in the next work and to kind of um, recreate this or just explore this phenomenon that we, we are facing today. Um, then, you know, at the time it was 2018 and Brexit was had just happened. Trump was, you know, Boris Johnson and Bolonaro and, you know, all of these world leaders that were fiercely aggressive were ruling the world and I was uh, waiting very impatiently to go out with my friends to have rosé in August sitting in my rocking chair and then this lightning came down uh, to to do this banal novel um, where empathy ruled and the power uh, had shifted. So leaders were chosen because of their empathy and I would write a utopia. So this was supposed to be a utopia. And it felt so, it felt like a prank. You know, it felt <laughs> so bad. The idea was so bad that it was so good, you know. And... Uh, and so, you know, I started giggling and writing this utopia and for a few months. And then, uh, then the empathy test came. And as soon as it became regulated, the empathy test, I knew that my utopia was in trouble. And so it became more dystopian with every growing month. But I always hoped to, because it's a political, it's a rhetoric debate, whether everybody should take the test or not. Um, in the beginning of the novel, it's uh, two months until there will be a referendum, national referendum, on whether everybody should be marked, uh, undergo the test and be marked. And it's 1% that fails, and those who fail, um, they're offered treatment and they can take the test again and again and again. So um, <clears throat> I tried to sit out and not take a stand for the reader. And I always hoped that, that the reader would, um, will question themselves where the utopia ends and the dystopia begins and where uh, the rights of the individual begins and the rights of the society and community ends, you know, and it's, so it's always these these questions. Mm. In the book, you also have some letters that actually the book begins with one of those these letters. It's two friends writing each other, and it kind of comes in between the actual plot. Mm -hmm. What was your idea with these two two voices? Yes, um, again, I was very occupied with how. Um, you know the current affairs and how this 
kind of polarization affects uh, relationship, personal relationship. Tw these are friends, best friends who have been friends for 20 years and suddenly they cannot talk to each other anymore because there are microaggressions that are leading into the relationships. And um, well, the, the person, uh, Thea, who begins the book, these are these letters, they are completely outside from the plot and they just barged into the novel very late and they needed to be heard. And, um, and so um, that, that first letter is from a very obnoxious uh, mansplainer, who is a woman though, but, um, and she, um, she allows herself to go, she's maybe, you know, left side of the spectrum on the political spectrum or, you know, she follows the politically correctness, but she questions it as well. And she allows herself to go into this no man's land mm -hmm. that feels very dangerous, you know, and it, and for me, it also does feel today dangerous to, um, to, to, uh, venture into that void between the polars, polarized arguments. Mm -hmm. It feels like there is either you're with us or against us and left or right. And we should all just stick together because our fight is more important than uh, second guessing mm -hmm. or some kind of critical thinking. Um, there is of course critical thinking and there is space for it, but it felt when I ventured into this, I was always trying to reach the gray area in this novel, in every argument and with every character and making it hard for the reader to uh, make up their minds and decide this is right, this is wrong, this one is bad and this one is good, you know. And um, um, but by doing so, by not taking a stand for the reader and making it hard to uh, decide on these matters, I really gave the power to the reader to decide what the novel was about. So I've had so many different interpretations. Uh, people from the far right will love this novel because they will think it is uh, a satire on the left. Mm. And then a person that is left side of the field will think that it's a warning of a uh, dictatorship and, uh, and you know, that good intentions uh, pave the road to hell and, um, mm. and, um, and then anti-vaxxers loved the novel, you know, that they thought that it was, you know, and then people have also, um, mm. found, uh, found, um, likeness to the anti-abortion debate. Uh, just basically whenever, uh, some kind of government controls other people, like the, the people, then people will find their own parallels. Um, but I will say also that, you know, what I realized after the book came out and people really took the book and interpreted it as they completely wanted, I felt very powerless and I did, uh, second guess myself a lot if I had done right and just asking questions and not taking a stand. And, um, uh, yeah, so, um, not being dogmatic because you're, you're really letting it uh, simmer and we can all uh, look into this book and, and find little pieces. But I think it's actually a big argument for, for not being, uh, either way, always being yeah. critical of what you, what you presented. Yes. And, and to create the space where we can talk to each other. Mm. We have to somehow collectively create a space for arguments mm -hmm. where we are not shut down yeah. or we're not, uh, you know, and 
yeah, it's just we have this is very problematic, I think, for us right now, for our time, for our time to to create this space, safe space where we can have honest questions when we don't know something without um, the the guns being taken out. Yeah, but that's. I think it's a, it's clever that you make this empathy test. Uh, it could have been anything, really, you put in there. But you you make it in the future, so so nobody can say this is this exact. But I can see how it can uh, be read in in many ways. Yeah. Um, just to go a little into the novel, you have like four characters, and um, like the main characters are more than that. But uh, two of those is like protesting that has taken the test, and two hasn't. Could you? Talk a little bit about the two that are for the testing. For the testing. Yeah. Okay. Well, to begin with, I was I was very occupied with profiling in this book about identity profiling and stereotypes and how we will empathize with with how the reader will empathize with the character. So I started out with four stereotypes. These are all persons or characters that we've seen somewhere else mm. we've seen the the young uh, thief who is uh, d- using drugs we've seen um the woman in the corporate ladder who is basically a man you know just wearing a female mm-hmm. suit we've seen uh the victim who we uh, naturally empathize with in the beginning and then only is the polite um good intentioned uh, politician who is um, in the campaign for the marking. Um, so the victim of stalking, she is somewhere in between. She has marked herself and is using the marked neighborhoods to um, create a safe space from her ex-lover who started to stalk her. Uh, but she still has questions about this, um, about the marking system. Um, but uh, only the one that is campaigning for, uh, he's in the psycho, uh, psych- uh, psychology um, association, and he um, he wants to categorize everything within the human Mm. and he wants to treat people like cars you know he wants mechanical uh mechanically to create a better society and he's trying to enforce that with you know these solutions Mm. uh but somehow you know it's uh it leads to these questions of trust, how we trust our people and the community. And when we need security and, and the feeling of being safe, we're often blocking a lot of people out when we're locking ourselves in. And um, yeah. He's an interesting character because he's married to a, a psych psychologist I think mm-hmm. his wife and she started out being pro the test and and becomes more and more <laughs> again <laughs> and uh, and they have some uh, fierce arguments that actually ruins a lot for them um, and she gets to be the, the voice of reason sometimes mm-hmm. but he's very convinced mm-hmm. all through the novel actually of and and you you actually make it like an empty test for the reader don't you a little bit, yeah. yeah. It's, I, uh, it's hard to feel something for all of them, and and especially the one that really goes to heart is the young criminal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, but you also uh, tell us his whole life story, so we we have more to work with with him, right? <laughs> absolutely. Um, in that case, I was uh, like like in the polarized debates is when you get information at a certain time that will change your empathy and your stance very easily mm-hmm. and that and i think that in general we are usually very obedient when it comes to 
both societal matters. We want to, we, we choose leaders to follow and trust. And when we read, we are usually quite obedient. We trust the <laughs> author to lead us. And often it's, we feel that some, something is right, that we should feel this way. And we are guided often through um, what character is empathetic and what is not empathetic, you know. And, it's, and there's so many cues in literature of an empathetic character, mm -hmm. you know, a, a person that is good uh, to others, a person that has suffered, uh, you know, um, hurt, your know, pain, you know, and uh, and there's so many literary cues, you know, for that. So I was just always um, asking my my reading friends when I had the script. How do you empathize with this character now? And how do you, you know, based on, on the chapters, how, how much information they had? So I just really wanted to uh, leak the information slowly but surely to try to make it tough, mm -hmm. difficult uh, to, to decide is this a good or a bad person, you know? Because it's not that easy to figure out because even though... Uh, Ole and uh, and his friends, they want to make the society better. They have a noble uh, need and uh, longing for that, but still he has no uh, real empathy himself when it comes to other people. It's... Uh, yeah, that's, that's the thing as well that I wanted to explore is that when, you know, um, we, when, when, when we share the values of the herd, it's such much, much uh, easier to empathize mm. with the individuals that share your values. But as soon as the individuals deny or cannot participate in these shared values, then we marginalize them, you know. Yeah. So it's uh, the, the empathetic people in the novel, they cannot, they turn their empathy off towards the people who refuse to go to the empathy test. You know, so I really... I really love navigating that conflict, you know. Uh, the uh, hard part of this book, it's really, it's a, it's a challenging book to read, actually. Even though it's easy to read, it's, it's still, it, it continues to work in your mind afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see, uh, I think you already maybe have answered it a little bit, but do you think it's, uh, it's worse in our Nordic welfare societies than in other places, this need to follow the leaders and... Um, is it is it more like a, I don't know, commentary to our uh, part of the world, or I think that we are especially obedient. Yes, I think that we are very. Um, I knew, I mean, it's. I think Denmark is also very good in following rules. You know, I I go to the train station and a complete stranger will no 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 be here be here you know and uh, shh, and you know at a read thing and and uh, and it's. Uh, I love it. It is, you know, this kind of communal togetherness in a way to to have these strict rules. Um, but it definitely can. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if if uh, I. I don't have any feelings towards it. It is what it is, and it has great sides and it has probably bad sides, mm. especially if. Uh conversation stops that it would be really bad yes i think we have to be very vigilant with uh, always asking questions and being able to do so I whatever that's a good thing to end on thank you very much frida <laughs>